The periodic table is the most useful tool in all of chemistry and possibly the whole of science. In this video, we look at its structure, its properties, and its function. But before we launch into a description of the periodic table of the elements, let's remind ourselves a bit about elements. We have already noted that, as far as we chemists are concerned, elements are the simplest form of matter that exists and they cannot be broken down into other substances by chemical means. They are the building blocks of matter since two or more elements can combine via chemical reactions to form literally millions and millions of different compounds. They are composed of only a single type of atom and each atom or element is assigned a name, a symbol and a number. And the atoms of an element also have their own characteristic mass known as the atomic mass. We also know that there are 92 naturally occurring elements and that we could list these elements numerically from number one hydrogen to number 92 uranium. We've only listed the first 20 here to save space. We could also list them alphabetically from actinide to zirconium, but either of these two approaches will produce a long unwieldy list of 92 elements that's not particularly user friendly. So during the early part of the 1800s, as the list of known elements grew, attempts were made to find some sort of order or pattern among the elements, in particular with regard to their chemical and physical properties. So, for example, it was noted that lithium, with an atomic number of 3, or Z equals 3, and sodium, atomic number 11, and potassium, atomic number 19, were all soft, lustrous, highly reactive metals that shared very similar physical and chemical properties. It was further noted that the elements immediately preceding each of these elements in terms of atomic number, helium, atomic number 2, neon, atomic number 10, and argon, atomic number 18, were all inert non-reactive gases that tended not to form chemical compounds. These observations of regular, repeating, or periodic patterns of properties culminated in the independent discovery of what is now known as the periodic law by both Dmitri Mendeleev and Julius Meyer in 1869. The modern version of the periodic law states that when the elements are arranged in order of increasing atomic number, elements with similar chemical and physical properties occur at periodic intervals. The work of Mendeleev and Meyer led to the development of a graphical representation of the elements which we call the periodic table. And we see a modern form of that graphical representation here, starting with number one, hydrogen, in the top left hand corner, moving across to number two, helium. We come back to the next horizontal row, lithium at number three, going across the second row all the way to neon at number 10, and so on down through the periodic table until we get to number 92 uranium at the bottom of the table. In words, the periodic table can be described as an arrangement of elements in order of increasing atomic number in which elements of similar chemical and physical properties are placed in vertical columns known as groups. So for example, lithium, sodium and potassium all share similar chemical and physical properties and are all placed in the same vertical column or group. Similarly, helium, neon, and argon are all noble gases. They tend not to react. They're all non-metal gases at room temperature, having similar physical and chemical properties. And so they are also placed in their own same vertical column or group. Now, you will generally have a copy of the periodic table at hand during your chemistry studies, so detailed memorization is not normally required. However, being able to recall specific information of the first 20 elements or so will be very useful. What's more important to learn is how to use the periodic table, and there are many useful trends that you can predict from the position of an element in the periodic table. So, for example, you can predict the relative size of atoms, the relative size of ions, ionization energies, electron affinities, valency and ionic charge, and therefore, most importantly, you can predict chemical formulas of compounds containing a particular element. And you can do all of that based on the position of an element in the periodic table. For now, however, let's look at some of the general features of the periodic table and its structure. Each element on the periodic table is represented by a square box containing useful information about that element. At a minimum, all versions of the periodic table should give the atomic number of an element, its chemical symbol, and its atomic mass. 
The elements of the periodic table are separated into main group elements, which include both the S block and the P block elements on the left and right hand sides of the periodic table respectively. The middle of the periodic table is dominated by the transition metals or D block elements, while the inner transition metals or F block elements are separated from the main body of the table at the bottom. These S, P, D and F block groupings arise out of the different ways that electrons are arranged or configured around atoms of elements in each group. And we go into the electronic structure of atoms and elements in more detail in later videos. The seven horizontal rows of the periodic table are called periods. There are two elements in the first period, eight elements in the second period, eight elements in the third period, increasing to 18 elements in the fourth period and 18 elements in the fifth period. Now, it may look like there are 18 elements in the sixth period as well, but there are actually 32 elements in the sixth period because if we start at element 55 in period six and go across to 56, we see we jump to 71. So elements 57 through to 70 in the bottom part of the periodic table are effectively squeezed into where this solid line is on the periodic table. So these extra 14 elements actually make 32 elements in total for period six. Now period seven only has six naturally occurring elements, starting with francium and radium at 87 and 88, and include the four elements in the actinide series culminating in uranium at number 92. The rest of the elements in period seven are called the transuranic elements, and these are unstable, synthetically produced elements that we tend not to have to concern ourselves with in our chemistry studies. The 18 vertical columns of the periodic table are called groups, and they are numbered one through to 18. However, an old convention of naming the groups using Roman numerals and the letters A and B shown here is still useful in remembering some of the trends observed in the periodic table and we will refer to both group naming conventions throughout this video series. The names of some of the most important groups of the periodic table are shown in this table here. Group 1 or Group 1A elements are known as the alkali metals. Group 2 or Group 2A elements are known as the alkali earth metals. Over on the right hand side of the periodic table, Group 16 or Group 6A elements are called the chalcogens or chalk formers. Group 17 or group 7A are the halogens or the salt formers and group 18 or 8A are the noble gases and they are the gases that tend not to form chemical compounds and tend not to take part in chemical reactions. The elements of the periodic table are roughly divided into metals and non-metals by a thick staircase line running from boron at the top to astatine at the bottom. The elements on the left hand side and in the middle of the periodic table are metallic elements or metals, with the exception being hydrogen at number one. Therefore, the majority of the 92 naturally occurring elements are metals. Now, metallic elements share certain physical and chemical properties. For example, as far as physical properties are concerned, all have a high luster and all are silver in color, with the only two exceptions being copper and gold which have a copper color and gold color respectively. All metals have high electrical conductivity and high thermal conductivity. They are solids at room temperature with the exception being mercury. And most of them are ductile and malleable, which means they can be drawn into long thin wires or pressed down into thin sheets. And most metals have high melting points, again the exception being mercury. The most important chemical properties that metals have is that they tend to lose electrons to other substances in chemical reactions to become positively charged ions, which we call cations. And more on that process in later videos. Hydrogen is on the left-hand side of the periodic table, but it is a non-metal. So it is an exception as far as its position in the periodic table is concerned, with the rest of the non-metals appearing in the upper right-hand corner of the periodic table. Non-metals share similar physical properties, including a lack of luster, low electrical and thermal conductivity, and they tend not to be very malleable or ductile. They could either be gases, solids or liquids at room temperature, and there is no hard and fast rule here. They generally have low melting points and low boiling points, especially compared to metals, and they tend to have a low density. So many of these physical properties being almost the opposite to metals. 
The most important chemical properties of nonmetals is that they tend to gain electrons from other substances and chemical reactions to become negatively charged ions called anions. And again, that's exactly the opposite to what happens with metals. The elements that lie near the bowl diagonal line are called the metalloids. And the metalloids share some physical and chemical properties with metals and some physical and chemical properties of nonmetals. The metalloids can gain, lose, or share electrons during chemical reactions depending on the substances with which they react. So, not only does their position lie between metals and nonmetals in the periodic table, their chemical and physical properties also lie between metals and nonmetals.